just go ahead and, and get started with the work session. And we'll start with uh, Ms. Mazur and the uh, personnel rules, policies, and procedures, specifically section 4.06, the section right. on on-call employees. All right. Ms. Mazur. Yes. Um, as you know, earlier this year, the mayor appointed a committee to take a look at the employee handbook overall and come up with some recommendations to bring to her and to the council. And we are on our fourth draft and uh, have not yet gotten it to her for her input and review. But there is this issue that has survived all four of the drafts to date that has to deal with on call. Um, and it's an inequity that we felt we didn't want to wait until such time as we're ready to bring the entire book to you because we didn't want to do it piecemeal. But this we felt should not wait for another six or maybe nine months before we're ready to have a, uh, a product for you all to look at and to give us input. Um, as you know, the uh, handbook does call for utility employees to be on call and to be compensated accordingly. That is the only department that is being compensated for being on call. Public works and IT um, are not. They're not mentioned in the book. And we, from day one, looking at the, the handbook, had determined that those two departments needed to be added because they are basically doing that, but they're not being treated equitably with um, utilities. So we made the decision to break our little rule and bring this one forward to you to consider uh, now. Um, to get things fixed, so to speak. So Richard had set up a, a rotation uh, program for Public Works, and I'll let him explain how he sees this working. And, I, and I'll share this with you, and, and, and I, I, this is actually a memo that we prepared about a year ago. We'll take one and pass it around. And it was just trying to, to figure out a mechanism. Um, you know, t as, it, as it works today, um, we assign a supervisor on a weekly rotation to be the point of contact. We don't say stand by and on call since we don't qualify for that, but meaning that if there is a need that is related to public works, whether it be a road issue, a drainage issue, a building issue, uh, possibly a park issue, uh, dispatcher call contacts that, that supervisor and uh, that supervisors expect to receive that call and and if if we can coordinate with the paid person on call from utilities to get the problem addressed we'll try to do that we luckily do have a sanitation person that works some hours on the weekend if it's during that time period if that person can handle that we try to do it where it has the least budget and lifestyle impact on our employees but in reality, rarely a week goes by that, that a public works person does not get an after hours on call. And understand, uh, one of the challenges is our supervisors are all exempt employees, meaning that they don't even qualify for call-in pay at that point in time, meaning that they, they go and address it and, 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 and so be it. Now, if the problem is to the extent we have to bring in an hourly employee to operate a piece of equipment, they are guaranteed two hours minimum uh, or the actual time uh, during the on-call. And my proposal to the mayor at that time was that there is a recognition that utilities are gonna have more, more frequencies of call-in due to power service issues or gas service issues, water, sewer. And, and assuming that, that, that public works probably only represents 50% of the after-hour on-calls compared to utilities, uh, you know, my recommendation at that time is how do we handle the exempt employees and my rec recommendation, we have five supervisors in public works and a rotation uh, that for every cycle that they participate in, they earn four hours of comp time. Now, as far as budget dollars, that's neutral. Now, of course, that person probably will take that time off, so you won't have that person here. And that if it is an hourly person, it would be 50% of what's given to the utilities they get 16 hours of additional pay for a week of being on call my recommendation for public works would be eight hours on the building maintenance since I understand that there's a building issue uh, regular public works can't deal with that that's going to be handled by, by by Lance and his staff and they have a total of six people on staff uh, so they have a, a one in six rotation and my recommendation on building maintenance in, since that the, the pool of personnel is so small that they would be noted equivalent to utilities on call with the supervisor if it's his week would be the same four hours of comp time since he's an exempt employee. 
and just want to you know get y'all's input and feeling um, it's tough uh, because when the expectation is is that that employee during that week has got to be available uh, and uh, they can plan any activities uh, that involve them going out of town on the week that their weekend of their assignment and they you know they can't enjoy a cold drink during a football game on Saturday if it's their week because there's a chance they get a call in and, and we can't have uh, them uh, consuming uh, adult beverages that time so they they get that burden placed on them but but they don't get any opportunity for compensation and, and we'd like to at least correct that in the handbook so it picks up both IT which uh, you know there are are that and uh, as well as public works uh, call-ins let me ask you just on, on public works I want to make sure I understand this right so they would be given eight hours per weekend of comp time and um, so roughly if they're on a, a five-week rotation, they're, they're roughly working 10 weekends or on call 10 weekends a year. That's roughly, correct. 10.4. Um, so they would, they would essentially wind up with, with 80 hours of comp time uh, a year. Is that right? No, I have it complete with four hours of, let's see, let me make four sure. Four hours per day, right? Well, I, I may have said this wrong. I propose a comp time would allow a half a day for every weekend assigned on call oh, every standby. Weekend. I'm sorry. So I that, I, I had yeah. that as weekend. So, so that would every weekend half a day. So cut that in half. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, and then I say it was result in 40 hours of flexible comp time for the year yeah. if they okay. work 10 cycles. That's what I meant. Okay. That's why so, I asked to make sure I'm and, and I may need to check my number agreement in there. I, and make that's sure probably that's accurate. I, I had it for, per weekend. Whereas right. if it was an hourly employee, it would just be eight hours of regular overtime for that or regular pay for that week cycle that they well, actually know if you look on the back side what you handed out under compensation it does say well for assigned experienced operators they should be compensated <coughs> four hours of one call standby standby pay for each weekend day which is eight hours total for eight a, hours per weekend yes and that's half of what the utilities are currently receiving and I think considering that the chances of being called in about 50% of utilities that seems equitable to me Says, the says two weeks of says four hours of one cost them all pay for each weekend day or eight total. That's eight total per weekend. That's correct. Eight eight additional hours where right now the public uh, for public utilities get sixteen hours. That's a, okay. So, so that's then the you go eight and that's time ten weekends, but still that's back to eighty it's, hours, not it's, forty. It, well, I'm I'm talking about two different things. Hourly employee would get four hours per weekend day. For eight hours for a cycle, meaning that if they're on from Monday to Monday, their paycheck would have 48 hours of regular time unless they're called in, and the, the time would calculate accordingly. If they're a salary exempt, my recommendation is is a half a day for every weekend, which is a Saturday. So, so exempt is half a day. That's correct. 40 hours, and yeah. for, for those that are paid, it's eight hours for a weekend. That's correct. But that's pay, not comp time. That's correct. Basically giving them an extra eight hours of straight pay. That's correct. What happens if you need more than, uh, I mean, indeed, I'm looking at the public works teams. There's two, two per team. And what, what happens when you need to call out more? Are those people paid? No. Uh, it, basically, if we get into a response situation to something that's bigger than the, either the primary or their back or their, their their assigned experience operator, then we we result to normal operations. Meaning we get on the phone and whoever is available and, and ready, they come in. They're going to get guaranteed two hours minimum, even if it's okay, only. So they get paid, right? They're going to get paid. Yeah. And if they if we end up working eight hours, that's going to calculate on their time card as overtime if, if they're for every hour over 40 in a given week so um, okay. that's pretty much an emergency situation yes I, I mean you know you go back and look at the flood event of 2014 we probably you know I, I wasn't I was in Daphne but we probably ended up calling in 16 17 people to close roads and manage it and they were just it just calculated as call as, as and it was are you available and are you capable yes come on in
Council, do you have any um, comments or questions about this? I, th I think it looks good. Appreciate all the time and effort and detail. How often uh, does it, you pretty much get called in about every weekend? It's inconsistent. Uh, I was on a week ago and got zero calls. Arthur got three. And and this last week they finished today. So, you, you know, it, it just, uh, you never Law know. Averages yes. Uh, yeah. Kevin and Jay, if you haven't seen this, we're just they're, they're talking about editing the employee handbook to include four hours of comp time for every weekend that an uh, exempt salaried employee is on call. And there was no change to the, to the paid employee, right? Well, it, it, my record. I don't have the before and after here. Well, there is. There is the, the the only thing an hourly employee gets in public works if they're called in. Right now, they're guaranteed two hours. Okay. Now, if they call in and it takes three hours, they get paid three hours. They get, they get once it passes two, it gets actual time worked. Uh, where what this does is that it it compensates them for giving up their weekend to stay stay based at, at home and and available to the phone and and uh, making sure that they're behaving, uh, it gives them an additional eight hours of regular time added to their paycheck. But understand, if that employee gets called in three times, okay, and that three times exceeds eight hours, and it just calculates as whatever <coughs> it is, meaning that you, you don't you don't get to double dip, meaning that it, that's correct. That's how it does. Well, you know, anything above 40, you have to pay overtime. So the on call would be at an overtime rate. Well, that's, I, I've always understood that overtime only calculates for four, anything after 40 hours physically working. Meaning, that's, that's correct. Meaning that if, let's say, you're on call and you're an hourly employee in public works and, and you all prove this, if nobody calls that seven days, then your check will have 48 hours of regular pay in it. But if you came in and you worked your regular 40 and you got called in one time and you spent four hours, it actually would calculate at, at 44 hours of regular pay and four hours of overtime. Because we've been doing it wrong if that's the case. Work for 44 hours. Right. That, that's I don't it think right. we've been okay. doing it. Have we been doing it that way? Okay. But you don't get the four hours overtime plus the eight hours. It, right. it, it backs gotcha. off that eight hours. Now, back when you when you introduced this, did you not say public works? Did I hear you say IT as well? Well, IT is getting called in, mm -hmm. and I don't I don't can't speak for them. I don't know if they're getting compensated, but the employee handbook does not include them in exactly. on call standby. But they do get called I don't know in. That you're gonna you're not gonna have enough for five teams, right? Well, see, they, re they work remotely. They have an entirely different scenario, so it's not like they have to go out somewhere. So usually. what's the proposal from the IT department? Um, we don't have one. Um, what you got was what we have in draft four, um, and we don't have an, an absolute proposal from IT. I don't think Jeff even knows that we're discussing them tonight. <laughs> Surprise, Jeff. Um, what, what I sent over to Lisa was what we have in, in draft four, and it does include IT, which in my mind was going to work up the same way utilities was working up. But see, they're so different because they work remotely in most of their cases. understood this right if they work for if they get called in after a 40-hour week they are not call and they get called in and work four hours you said they're gonna get paid 44 hours of regular time well there's four a, hours a, of overtime I, and, and, and Jill may want to jump in here as I understand it overtime only calculates based upon physical 
time physically working during a work week. So meaning that, is my understanding, it's just my understanding, is that if you have worked your normal 40 hour shift Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. and you get called in and you're on call, and you were scheduled to get eight hours of pay whether you got called or not, if you end up working four hours, your, your physical time on the clock becomes 44 hours. And they, they backed out. I'm with you now. And they then you, out. you back that four hours out of the eight, but those four should calculate as overtime at time and a half because you have physically worked more than 40 hours I'm in that you, paid I, week. I, I didn't so. follow the eight hours. Yeah. According to Nancy, four, four. Um, the emergency call out and the on call are separate, they're mandatory mm -hmm. OT. Um, so you could have zero worked hours, but if you get on call an emergency call out, you have to pay overtime. Right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, though, if you are a non exempt employee and you're on call and you don't get a call any, you're going to get paid eight hours of overtime, right? Because it's eight hours of no, no, regular hours. Hours. You're going to get eight That's hours. how I understand it, right. yeah. So if you get called out for two hours, you're going to get six hours of straight time and two hours of overtime. That's how, if you've worked 40 during your regular uh, Monday through Friday job, yes. Let me ask you this, then. It says they would be non-exempt again, compensated four hours of on-call standby, standby pay for each weekend day. And I, is there a chance that they wouldn't be on call for one weekend day, or is it always going to be? I mean, as because the exempt states it's slightly different. It says yeah. four hours for, for every weekend. Why didn't you just say eight hours for every weekend as, a, as opposed to four hours and for every I, and weekend? And again, I will clean that up. Okay. Uh, it is con it, There are a number of confusing there. Yeah, I used, okay. uh, right. I used I, weekend I know, days and then weekend. Saying, well, but, you can have Sunday off now or something. Yeah, no, my, my intent is that if you're hourly, your, your compensation would be an eight-hour addition to your paycheck for that week you're on call. If your salary, you would earn four hours of comp time for that same week being on call. And, and I've talked to my supervisors about this before I drafted this memo a year ago, and, and, and every one of them said that the, 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 the 50 <coughs> cents on the dollar time off was more valuable than actual money to them. I mean, so, um, uh, which I thought was a good trying to be sensitive to the budget. It, it is, but is it, does it create a shortfall when you need it? I mean, there's two sides to that, too. Considering the number of our senior supervisors that leave vacation on the table every year, uh, you know, it's a little sneaky on my part is how much of it will actually ever get used. I don't know. Nope. I'd have to be thankful to say. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I admire guys that, that like to work, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, we do have a, a, a program where you have, you can, you can't carry vacation after a certain point. So, it, you know. Trying to edit to have an allocated amount since we typically approve up to a certain it was about 416 hours for non-exempt, roughly, you just call it 208 hours for two hour, 208 hours of comp time given, right, 52 times 4, and then 416 hours of pay. We don't know how much that would be OT or not. No, because it's always, yeah, and plus different people make different amounts, so. <clears throat> Looks good to me. and see what happens, kind of planning the works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what about, like, several times, I, I've been taking on call, it ain't cost y'all a dime for the last three years. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I know y'all <laughs> <laughs> But it's just say like I get called in, and it's an air conditioner at the jail, which is a real likely call. Uh, last week we had a burn a light on fire. <clears throat> I come in, I'm going to get half a day for comp time. But what if I'm there 12 hours trying to get that air conditioner? And that's happened several times. 
I don't think you need to be selling yourself right now. I, I think you you have it sold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm just yeah. saying, you know, is there, you know, why would I answer the telephone for four hours if I'm going to go to 12 hours? Richard? Don't you get overtime for the time actually work? Well, no, and, that, and I understand that's that's the the tough part with exempt employees is that you know, and this is the reality yeah. is that, that you are you are paid a salary to do a job. If it right. takes you sixty hours in a week to do that job, then so be it. And theoretically, if the next week it only takes you thirty, so be it. As long as you're accomplishing your job, uh, you know you're being compensated for it. I'm just trying to at least give and. That may be a, a flaw of the structure of public works is all of our supervisors are exempt employees, which I think to me is a good thing because many of them work more than eight hours a day because they, they're committed to their job and you know and things of that nature and there's a value to that. So, I mean, this is better. Uh, I think, it, you know, now of course, if I was Lance, I, I would make sure that my AC tech who's an hourly employee, I would probably, if, I, if I, once I come to a conclusion that it's going to be a long drawn out process, I'd have that person in there handling that because they have a mechanism to get at least compensated for actual time on the job, so. But you can't get the, you're the guy, you're it. You can't get anybody to talk about Okay. I mean, it, it, Again, that's, you know. Yeah, when, we, when we haven't been paying them on call, you know, I, I, we're not paying them anything, so I can't make them, I can't make them answer that telephone on the weekend. Well, answer, that's that's great. That that's where we come. That's why we're here to get the the hourly yeah, employees compensated this one, for this one. This one addresses that's, it. Yeah, it that's going to take care of that. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, they says they must be available by cell text and or hard line phone. And as I yeah. understand it, you set up a rotation for people to serve yeah. for for these on call weekends, so they don't have a choice in the end, and they'll get compensated. Yeah. And but, uh, now what he said was he is the on call guy. Well, but but Lance, we've, we've already got he's finally got a staff big enough where they can have a rotation. So that and he he's got to yeah. let them be in that rotation. Now, granted, uh, the, the one of the challenges with building maintenance is that he has a person who is a really good plumber. He has a person whose expertise is electrical. He has a person that's HVAC. Now, granted, I could see where the problem at hand may be. HVAC, HVAC and the electrical guy is the guy on call. At that point in time, there's going to have to be a conversation among their department. Are you available? Can you come in? And yes, it may be that the supervisor, who is the, the, the master of all those trades, <coughs> may end up in there to, to, to troubleshoot and do the problem. Me involved just about every time. Right, but but just, so that's just like Orville got called right, last so. week three times. It rolled me, so then you know I had to take it, and that's fine. Yeah, I'm that's, just that's trying a to make scenario, my scenario, though. That's a good example of. Yeah. A flaw, but mm -hmm. it's not perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I think it's an improvement. Yes, um, something to work on. I mean, something to build a base for. Would there be a problem, say, if, if, if I did work more than four hours? Could I at least get comp time for the remainder of the time that we work? Um, the way I'm seeing this, the way it's written, it doesn't provide for that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think for exempt because. I think that's the mentality that, you know, your salary didn't, you're likely going to work more than 40 hours. I mean, that's kind of the way supervisors are done. I see what you're saying. I mean, I hear what you're saying, though. It, 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 <coughs> Do we you, not you have, have a 60-hour week and... That's right. Do we not have any HVAC time. subcontractors that are called in for anything? You can give them. You know, if we can come in and take care of it and it costs us eight hundred dollars to bring in train, it's gonna cost us five, six thousand dollars possible. And so I mean we have kept the contractors out of y'all we have saved a tremendous amount of money. But you're saying that with the new the, the help that you have in your department, they can't take on some of this if we change this yes, this they, aspect. They okay. can take it on, but say if Cody is on call. I can make him carry his phone, and he's got to be available right. for that weekend. I haven't had that. I've written that. Right. That's yeah. what we're trying and to do. Now you're getting it. Yeah, that's the purpose of going on. Since all of your people are hourly, they're <coughs> going to get dollar compensation right. for being go. on call. And if they're physically right. here, they get compensated right. above and beyond right. that based upon the time in as long as it exceeds but eight hours. If Kevin's on call and 
there's an H back out and Cody isn't on call, I'm going to get that call. Well, that's that's being a supervisor, Lance. Right? Well, I'm gonna call everybody. I'm gonna let you sit over here in my seat. I'm gonna go over there. Thank you. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's tough to say. Yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah. I've seen it both ways, guys. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, I'm an I'm an exempt employee in my job, and I've had weeks that I worked 80 hours and I got no compensation, and, and then sometimes they'll approve it. Uh, sometimes they'll approve overtime. We don't get overtime pay; we get straight time. But I've, I've seen both. I've seen both arguments. Uh, lived through both arguments. So. Uh, well, I, I think guess what I would maybe just suggest at this time is to, to see how this works. I mean, things can always change. That's right. Mm -hmm. It can be revisited. Yes, it's sir. a step in the right it direction. It is a step and it's towards compensating you for that additional yeah, time. Yeah, and it's giving Lance that. the tool he needs to make sure his guys are available when assigned. Yeah, and, and I know that probably the law of averages, you know, even if you go three weekends of being on call and you don't get called in, there's going to be that weekend where, mm -hmm. you, where you spend, you know, 12 hours a day, you know, and, and, and probably will maybe more than make up for that. But hopefully this is at least lessening the blow. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I do, I do okay. sympathize Lance, though, with, with, the, with the work. And I, I do think that the things brought up is you, you do have a unique situation where you have right. specialty people on call. And I can't tell you how many times I've been to see Daddy and drove 110 miles back then. Is, is, there, a, uh, is there a possibility that in, in your department, instead of having weekends where there are people on call, you know, like, like if you were the only one qualified to handle every type of call, do we need to consider weekends where you don't have somebody on call, where you just have to call a I've got that set up too. I mean, we've got four depending on the call. But then, see, that comes into another whole issue there. Without being able to carry, have an open PO available at that point, we can't just call the other because we don't have. A PO well, we're, we're getting ready to change that too. We're, we're working hard. Yeah, and, and 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 we're we're we've been meeting as as between utilities and all of us talk about you know trying to be more efficient and use the city's resources better. I mean, it, just about every employee that we have should be able to operate a plung plunger and to get an on-call to plunge a toilet that took five minutes to do this when four people came by and said that wasn't their job, um, that were being paid to be there. We, we're working better to be better at that because, you know, by golly, I'd have come down here and plunged it if I was close <laughs> by. Is that a real-world scenario? Or, uh, <laughs> that really happened. Um, so, and frankly, there also has to be a judgment call that sometimes it's okay to put a sign on that toilet door that says out of order, yeah. be repaired on Monday. I mean, That's right. yeah. we don't really need to spend a whole bunch of money to, 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 to it, and there's a good chance that we can't get the part until Monday anyway, right. if it's about or something. Right. So we just gotta be a little, we gotta be better on our side too and be more proactive, so. Yeah. Especially those on the weekend, yeah. so things like that. Yeah, I mean, this day and age, They'll use the opposite sex as restroom. That's not a big deal. <laughs> With you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Wait a minute. Uh, I, I, what I think I was hearing was agreement, though, Clark. Yes. yes. So we'll, okay. I'll get my number okay. uh, 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 agreement I lined up. And it. We'll put something together for you to take a look at for a resolution. Ordinance. Ordinance. Yes, excuse me, it is an ordinance. Okay. Budget. Mr. Cortinez. Sir. <coughs> All right, Mayor Council. Um, I'm going to ask Jill to scroll through that for me and mm -hmm. go through um, budget wise. Okay, in Munis, it's um, yeah. 001130. Yes. Or you can go to page 16. Uh, just as well, if you have any questions, 16. really, the only Question thing 18. that's terribly out of the ordinary, um, <clears throat> our training costs went up uh, because we have additional certifications through the inspectors that have been obtained, and uh, we all have CEU requirements for those certifications. 
So uh, the training costs went up a little bit because we're, we're paying for those certifications. They benefit the city, and they have to go to classes to obtain the CEUs for it. Um, I have one item that's, uh, that's out of the ordinary. Um, I had requested, and tell me, I believe it's still in there, for um, the scanning of the documents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. Just so you know, and I, I did this for you guys. We have in our office uh, what we refer to as the tube wall. You might have, Robert might have seen it. Um, on the back, this is, these are records and documents that we have uh, paper copies of, and those things date back to the 70s or 80s. Um, and it takes up a tremendous amount of space. Now, the first page you see is the actual tube wall that's got all those documents on it. The follow-on uh, pages are the boxes of permit files that we have to keep in the office because we're still getting we're still having to go back into those files instead of taking them to archive because we're in them so much um, I had spoken to I know Lisa and I had both spoken to a scanning contractor that's on the state bid they came and looked at it and they will come from Tallahassee scan all those documents pull them apart scan them put them save them electronically for us index them and then destroy the documents so we'll have everything electronic that you see on that very first page and uh, that's a little out of the ordinary I normally don't have that in there but uh, that cost was for the for what we have that you see in those photos was twenty one thousand dollars come pick them up take them back straighten them out scan them in index them and then destroy them um, they would be searchable too yes they yeah, would be searchable and everything we'd be able to get time. to it yes uh, yeah. Did we add also the museum and some of Lisa's things? Or that's yes. a different, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's same, in the, same company. And actually, yes, gotcha, and, gotcha. and let you know, the planning department also had, I think, four or $5,000 in their budget, and I know I don't think that was uh, brought up or much of an issue for them. This is all the same contractor. We just happen, I know Lisa's probably got a lot of records too, but we just have a lot of stuff, and it's it's old, and we'd like to get it electronically so we can so we can save it it'll be a huge help for Lisa yes. though, being searchable what, what I, mean, I mean where is that uh, expense once again is that the is that in the capital with the truck is that in the same that, it's you're talking about the scanning <coughs> yes yeah, yeah, the the professional scan? services professional services is okay scanning and destruction it's in account 50290 yes in munis go to that detail I don't, I was looking on page 16. Oh, there it is. There it is. No, I, I see it now. And in that same section that you're looking at, if you look on the screen, uh, they have that ICC plan review services. That is the uh, as needed on call if we have a major project um, that's going to take quite a while to review. We keep that in there, but that is also a pass-through account. Whatever the cost is that we have from the International Code Council to do those reviews, we <coughs> collect from the applicant. Now, we have not used that at all this year. Um, we used it for the uh, retreat at Fly Creek apartment project. We wanted that reviewed by them. Uh, there may be one upcoming project potentially that I may want to send to them just because they are the code writing agency and I want to make sure all T's are crossed and I's are dotted. But that amount is only spent if we choose to send something there and then it is collected back immediately from the applicant when they're paying their permit and inspection fees so it's it's budgeted in there so you don't so you'll see it if I send it but it's it zeros itself out now, I can't get on that detail uh, Jill, it won't let me go there when I click on that <coughs> so I don't have access to account central so I'm, I'm trying to go to that detail on the, on the scanning the 46,000 how much was that Eric? It was uh, twenty-five thousand for the ICC service, and then twenty-one thousand for uh, the scanning. The only 
exact cost that we know we're going to have is the 21 for the scanning. The 25 is just an as needed if we choose to use that service. And the ICC was the what? That's the International Code Council. They're the code writing agency and they have a plan review service. Does that, does that need to be in the budget? I, I think we do it so that when we get a seven or eight thousand dollar purchase order from the ICC, it's accounted for in the budget. Um, but like I said, as soon as we charge it, we collect it. So it really kind of zeroes itself out. I got you. Yeah. What, uh, I'll be honest with you, that, uh, that scanning service, I am shocked at how low that is. They came in and I walked him through. I, I, you know what, let's, what kind, uh, of, what kind of guarantees do they get that you, they're not, you know, because if they scan it and destroy it, yes. And then you're looking for it and it doesn't exist. Well, I would assume what we, we're going to inventory anything we send them. If they're going to come pick it up, we're going to log it in. A lot of that stuff you see is already logged in, but it's under access. We've had it in that access file forever. And we've got a log of most of that. We're going we're gonna to tally what we're sending them, and I'm going to you know, probably tell them do not destroy it until you send us the files and we actually spend the time to double check. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah. We'll, and they'll, they'll categorize it according to the year or Yeah, the way that numbers. we, well, if you look at the, the way that tube file is organized, you've got sections A, A through Z, and then it, within each section, it's one through 30 or 40, however many tubes are in there. So we have a spreadsheet that says plan number A21 is, that's the as built for gay for estates. And so that's how it's cataloged and it's written on the plan. <laughs> So when they send it to us, they're gonna they're gonna scan them by the same document number. They'll say A26, as built, gave her estates, and it's gonna be through that whole set of documents is how they'll index it for us. What about year to year to maintain? Well, yeah, what we're doing now is I'm requiring, and we you know planning department receives all of their stuff now electronically okay. anyway, and we have started the same. We're not doing it with residential yet. Uh, but we are doing it with anything commercial or multifamily. They're sending me those plans electronically, and I'm saving those on the file so I have them. And we're going to start indexing those the same way. So we've got them for significant projects. Yeah. And once, if you have any questions about that, I've just got one other item that I'll that I'll mention to you if you're. Um. Yes, sir. So that uh, that international code, <clears throat> the twenty five thousand dollars, and I apologize for asking this again, man. No, sir. Kind of multitask here. Sure. And this and this. And this. That's, that's okay. <clears throat> the um, we have we have employed them for some, uh, I believe, some drawing review services. Yes, sir. Is yes, sir. The same. It's the same that, one. That is okay. same one. Just, putting in a budget it may or may not be may or may not be used and even if we do use it like I said it zeroes out so whatever they they charge us we turn around and we charge immediately you to the applicant it, it saves on labor that yeah and it's really big projects like those of that apartment complex at Fly Creek that was a pretty detailed set of plans and it would have kind of slowed us down on reviewing other folks that had submitted stuff so we sent it to them plus we wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything funky in those plans that we didn't catch. Uh, so we got, you know, a, a good plan review back from them on all components and it was it was well worth it. Were you, I was gonna say, were you in, you know pleased with their results? Yes, you sir. Felt like they were thorough and it wasn't too cookie cutter that well, it's yes. No, I, I was pleased with the results. There were a few things that we still have to review because we have city specific requirements above and beyond what's in the international code. So we still look at it for those items, but the but the big items, the structural, the mechanical and all of that, it was it was a pretty good set of plans and I think, you know, if you're in construction, if you can start with a good set of plans, it makes that project so much easier instead of trying to piecemeal plans together. So I, I think it's worth it. And we we didn't we had that same money in this year. I didn't use it at all. We didn't send anything to them. We handled everything in house. I will tell you that if um, if and when they come to me with a boutique hotel in our downtown fire district, I'll probably want to send that to the ICC. I want them to take a look at it too. Questions, council? And, and the only other item personnel-wise, 
um, I requested a new j uh, title position created. Um, we're, we're having a lot of interaction with different utility companies. We're, we're talking to uh, Baldwin EMC and to Riviera and to the city utilities. And uh, we have a, an excellent electrical inspector and very knowledgeable electrical inspector on staff. And he's been handling a lot of those, those interactions. Um, but his title, as are all of the inspectors in the department, is building inspector. But he's, you know, representing the city at a lot of these meetings, and, and he's doing a lot of things for us. And um, to help him, you know, in, in his interaction, and to kind of, uh, you know, give him a, a proper title for what he's actually doing for us, I would like to, to create that chief electrical inspector position. That's fairly typical if you go to a lot of uh, other building departments. They have chief inspectors. Um, that one's a big deal because that's a that's a very technical field, and he's he's very very good at what he does. And and I'd like to have that. And and my intention is to promote from within. Um, I don't need another person in the office. I'd like to like to have him fill that position with his ability and his knowledge. All right, I got a couple more questions, and this is this is really splitting hairs as no. far as the overall budget. It's a tiny number, yes, sir. The entire budget, but it's a big number for what it is. And Understood. The credit card processing fees. Is eighteen thousand dollars worth of fees in the building department? Well, and I'm going to assume because I don't handle the credit card. You don't want me handling the credit card machine, but we take credit card payments for permits and tap fees. So when someone comes in and they've got fifteen thousand dollars in you know tap and building permit fees that is that is and they put it on a credit card and that's happening a lot with especially with big fees i guess you get points on that you get you know frequent flyer miles so that's happening a lot and what that would reflect would be the size of the permits and the fees that we are actually collecting but we we wrote an ordinance years ago when someone pays our utility bill i think it was maybe an electric bill if it exceeded a certain amount mm -hmm. that uh we believe we would not take credit card payments for that really? i remember well, the ones they i believe this whole percentage like most of these restaurants are in. well we were actually looking into that um, okay which one of those is required to over a certain amount we do not take credit cards and i believe that's uh, or just charge the, the, the fee yeah, well, we have an ordinance to charge the fee well, charge okay the fee. well we we don't have an ordinance yet but that was something that <clears throat> we need i've talked to him about i mean they're getting the benefit of the charge right. on the credit card the city i mean a lot of places are sharing okay. that expense but we do have yeah, and I can't speak deal. knowledably right. to that. Well, we need um, to look up the, do you know the current sure. ordinance, Kim, that I'm talking I about? I do not, but what I am looking at is to be able to pass that on for them to pay a convenience fee. Sure. And, um, I mean, what I'm familiar from the side I came from about building permits is they, they paid that fee if they wanted those permits. Okay, sure. And that that'd be fine. Process, but, um, yeah, I've looked, I've looked at, you know, like the golf course, the marina, um, you know, those kind of things that we could be able to have that convenience fee. On the utilities, you're getting a utility rate, which is, which is cheaper, mm -hmm. and then it's that really way you cannot cheap. pass that utility rate on to your customers. And so the conversations I've had with the mayors, I wouldn't change that, <coughs> but I would change these other outliers that are not a utility. Okay. We need to but I'll look up that, you know, at least. Yeah, yeah it's not like we had a lot of turnover. We need to look at, we have an ordinance. I want to make sure we get in a case that, that, that requires and, and and if that's the case it was like I, a really big commercial I want to say it was maybe you know, the schools the Board of Education yeah, they, was, was paying tens of thousands of dollars and and they were using a credit card and I believe that we require them now to do a bank draft or something such as that so we need to dig that up if, if you want um, and and I'll talk to uh, Gina Cindy and Martha uh, Martha about it they're probably uh, even if there's what, what's a percentage that you pay on a credit card I, two I don't three. two and a half to three if you'd like I mean it's fairly easy I can go back to our our permit fee ordinance and we can add a line in there about it and yeah, give them the option yeah we could do a pass through or yeah. yeah we can do that I mean that's I just need to know so that we can because currently our ordinance does not have any provision for that right. It has to be an ordinance. Yeah, our fees are set by ordinance. Yeah. Fees. 
you know, and I, I hate to get that. Oh, no, that's fine. Detail, but in your budget, $18,000 equals, you know, five or six categories yeah. of, of, of expenses. No, right? true. <clears throat> true. Um, yeah, if I can save $18,000, I'm happy to. And then on building fees, what is a, what is a building fee? Okay, help me out that's on that. those pass-through account with the state of Alabama. Oh, yes, yes. Um, the state of Alabama requires that we, connect, we collect a $1 per thousand in value fee and give it, send it back to the state. We do that on a monthly basis for the construction industry training system. And they use that money to go to junior colleges to encourage uh, technical classes for framing and mechanical and plumbing and electrical and that's mandated by the state of Alabama for oh, everything it's so it's a pass-through yes. yes sir it's a pass-through any other questions Back again. Good evening. I'm starting with streets. Yeah, and, and if I could, I, I do want to hit a, just a couple of quick high points. Um, I, I do want you to know from top to bottom in, in, in public works, there is no ask for additional employees in any of these budgets. However, in sanitation, we do have an ask to convert four existing positions, three of them are equipment operator, three, and one of them is already a crew leader to be up to the updated crew leader position. When I say updated, I'll hand you out the job description. It used to say trash crew leader, and it needs to say sanitation crew leader since we have garbage, trash, recycle, and landfill operation. That is about an $8,500 uh, annual for those four positions for that change, and that's in the budget. Just as a, as a 30,000 uh, scope view for the operational side, Streets is proposing com this budget compared to last year's budget, meaning what was, was approved last year, is a 4% increase. For sanitation, it's a minus 1.2% decrease compared to last year's budget. Building maintenance is the one that's going to freak you out a little bit because if you do that math, it's a 58% increase. And you'll see that most of that increase is in personnel, but you heard me just say there's no ask for personnel understand that the positions in building maintenance several of them lived in the utilities budget Two. this year they have been moved to their proper home and are being accounted for that way so that is there's no additional employee it's just being accounted for in a different low in the proper location of building maintenance and the mechanical maintenance from the operational side is a decrease of 0.6 percent um, so that's a big thing the other thing I, I want you to, it, this is an anomaly that when you have a pretty large employee base, if it, the most of the drivers of any increase here are the salaries. But if you go back and look at, for example, Streets Department, 2017, we only used 86% of the actual budget salaries. 2018, it was 89.5%. In 2019, if, if the projections hold true, it's 92%. Same as in sanitation, uh, those numbers vary anywhere from 95.5 to 90.6 to 85 percent of actual uh, versus budgeted. Why is that? And I, and I, I want you to kind of understand this uh, because it may give you an idea. From a budgetary standpoint, we have to budget as if every position is filled every day and they work 365 days a year. When you have a staff of nearly 80, that never actually really happens in the real world. For example, right now in public works, our average for the last two, three years is about a 15% turnover, meaning that we replace uh, uh, approximately 12 employees annually. And it takes about six weeks to replace an employee. So if you take six weeks times 12, that's, that's 72 weeks of those, those employees not physically being here being paid. Uh, Unfortunately, we run about 2.5 percent of our total staff is on FMLA or workman's compensation at any given time in the year. That, uh, that works out to be approximately two employees. Right now, we have two employees out, one on FMLA, one is out on workman's comp. They are not drawing salaries, meaning that budget line is not impacted uh, while they're on that leave. 
So if you take that, that, that represents another 104 weeks. So that's 176 weeks of, of, of pay that really doesn't get expended if the numbers hold true, which represents about an average that we, we don't have about 3.4 employees on average physically working on any given week, which is about 4.25% of our workforce. So that kind of explains to you why that number always trends around about 5% less than actual. So just, just keep that in mind. We have to budget the full cost of full employment. Now, when you get to a small department that has five people, you don't see that variance. But when you have a large department, you're just going to see it. it. It's normal. We have turnover, especially in our frontline jobs and things of that nature. So start in streets. As I said, uh, there's a 4.03% there's a increase over last year's budget. Uh, the majority of that does reside in salaries. If the trend holds true that I just discussed, then it's, it's pretty much even to last year. Uh, really, uh, there's, there's the, the, the increases that you will see in there is that there is an increase in flowers and street materials and landscape. Uh, and that is just the, the fact is that this year we'll have more planted flower beds than we did a year ago, which was more than a year before that. And I feel like that we have been self-performing more services within the city, fixing uh, sidewalks, drainage, and things of that nature, and thus that does lead to increased uh, materials and landscaping supplies in that area. Uh, the only other thing that you probably will stick out to you under professional services, even though the ask last year uh, was <coughs> at about 25 and some change, our actual is about 13 and some change, and that's really not going to change. But we're back to asking for 27. Remember, our bridge inspection is required every other year. So this is a bridge inspection year. And that contract last year was about $13,500. So that's why we're back at that 27. It should decrease every other year by that 13 dollars It just wasn't picked up last year. And it doesn't look like I'd, we're not going to spend that, that, that money from this year's budget. Uh, As far as uh, if you go to the detail under the uh, equi uh, capital for equipment, um, if you see a zero anywhere, that means it was an ask and part of the process with the mayor, it got taken out of the budget and we're fine with that. As I told the mayor, if I never had anything to start with, I didn't have a loss, I didn't necessarily gain anything, but I didn't lose anything, we understand. But we do have in here a used uh, F550 truck from the state yard at $40,000, a new uh, F250 long wheel base, uh, which is a replacement vehicle. Uh, and one of the things that's kind of a must have is a new uh, laser paint machine for striping. We do so much of the maintenance of our downtime parking and our paint machine is just shot, I'll just tell you. And then uh, $12,000 for a new uh, bush hog batwing rotary mower um, and then this is uh, one of those things that's been an ongoing project with us is we'd like to add 120 barricades to our parade route barricades at 13,500 as well as for 6,500 an additional trailer to handle those barricades and then this is one of those deals that the deal was too good to give up the gas department has a, uh, a cat to pillar backhoe a 420f that is coming off of lease that has a guaranteed buyout for less than fifty thousand dollars and it has less than 1200 hours on it and it's worth that every bit of that and we we would like to replace one of our older backhoes with that coming off of lease backhoe uh, i'm cat really would like you to return it to them because they'll sell it for more than fifty thousand dollars on the open market but it's our recommendation that we keep that and uh, and and pay that uh, buyout for the uh, the end of lease purchase uh, that's kind of street in a nutshell i'll be glad to answer any specific line items uh, everything else is pretty much routine Richard, the, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I, do, um, I do see some pretty large percentage increases, though. You, you, you do mention in, the, in the, the city's growing. There's an additional intersection, you know, every six months that we have to plant flowers in and maintain. But the, uh, the flower budget uh, went up by 23% and the street material and landscaping budget went up by 
and you know, that's a pretty big year over year. I mean, I can see five, six, seven, eight consistent with revenues, uh, revenue projections. Well, in mind, everybody at the table is predicted at five percent. So, why the the tremendous increase? Why the twenty three percent? That's a fourth of what we're doing now. Uh, you know, my directive to those supervisors when they work on these numbers, and, and you know, Paul uh, Merchant, who's our horticulturist, uh, prepared the flower budget, and of course, Arthur, George, and, and, and Paul worked together on the combined street material and landscape. You know, and, and, you know, based upon trends, those were the numbers that they proposed. Are they probably generous? Uh, yes. Uh, if you feel that it would be uh, worthy for us to revisit them and see if we can trim out of there, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, something that we definitely do. I think the tough thing with flowers is the number is pretty much going to kind of be what it is. Uh, you know, some of this is a commodity-based thing. Uh, you know, uh, Paul has already ordered tulips uh, because of the, the fact that you have to get them in and put them in the refrigeration and things of that nature or is in that process. So you're, you're, you're making plans based upon not knowing what the, the actual numbers are until you get those orders uh, into a vendor. But uh, I'll be glad to, uh, to go back and sit down with my folks and revisit those numbers. Um, Let me just give you another alarming number. And this is kind of a, you know, when you talk about trends, and I understand market, you know, the changes, and, and they kind of are what they are. But when I look at the street material, street material and landscaping, 2017 actuals to 2020 proposed budget, a 139% increase. Yeah, is it because you were detailed? Is there more detail? No, I don't have it in front of me. No, we really didn't. I mean, we, we can get in there and, I, and I, I can dissect that better for you. I, I will give you a real world example. Um, our in place bid for, for pipe, concrete reinforced pipe. Um, our bid that we had in place that, that they would not renew, a uh, 48 inch pipe. Uh, the price was $51.50 a foot. We went back out for bid, and that price for that same 48-inch pipe went up to $72.50 a foot, okay? And we had you reject that bid because we knew Sarpsy was bidding out pipe and we could join that bid. Well, they did a little better. They got $71.50 a foot, okay? That is what we're seeing. Uh, I, I had the buyers come to me the other day talking about concrete because they slipped in a delivery charge for loads less than five yards of concrete. And sometimes when you're doing a, a, even a couple of sidewalk repairs, you still only need a yard or two. Uh, when you add in the, the extra delivery charge for small loads, our cost per yard of concrete was up to like $164 a yard, okay? Because Mine's a 212. Hmm? Mine's a 212. 212? Okay. So, and, and understand, when I got here uh, two years ago, our average concrete price, price was $105 a yard. That, that's, that's, those are realities. And so that's some of those drivers. Yeah, the number you gave was, it went up 80%. Yeah. Uh, so. The problem is the market's hot out there, and those in the building trades know this: is that they're they're. they're and I guess so that's like a local commodity. You don't, you don't <coughs> ship concrete across the country; it just costs too much, right? You that's pay, right. Pay locally. Um, and especially the quick crete. Uh, here's the most amazing thing: the low price concrete pipe is being made in Columbus, Georgia, and still be delivered here at the lowest price. Uh, go figure. I don't tell me how that works. Um, so. Uh, let me, I'll be glad to look at those and I can sit down with the mayor. I mean, I, I'm not saying there's not room to, to move on there. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of a bottom line guy and I know that, that being mindful of, of, of inflation and growth that 4%, we're trying to be closer to 3% uh, in, in that category. I think there's some room to work there. I, I did go back and look at the detail and it looks like there were two um, Ammons and Blackman invoices that got coded here. Okay. That probably should have been put to the capital projects fund okay. for the resurfacing, and then there was one for the bulkhead repair. Okay. I'm not real sure that it needs to go in here either. No, that so. was, should have been standalone. Now, part of the Ammons and Blackman last year is that they did a bunch of street striping that was not associated with. They didn't actually resurface the road; they just striped the seats. So we did charge that. That was a a, a street materials uh, cost. That's a normal maintenance cost. So. Uh,
receives minimum is five yards? Anything less than five yards, they pop us with a $150 delivery, additional delivery charge. And that's for one location. If we make them move the truck more than a few feet, they technically could pop us for an additional. Uh, uh, Well, two yards, that's two, that's two and three, three yards. Well, and, and one of the things that George and I have talked about is, is that, you know, uh, wheeled loaders are handy, handy tools, and there's nothing that says stop the truck here, we'll put a couple yards in the bucket and run it down to this project and keep doing that until we get over five yards. So we're, we've been trying hard when we're doing concrete work to try to get enough projects in a reasonable location to exceed five yards because even if you waste a yard of it, you still come out ahead. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so if you'd like to go on to, to sanitation, uh, just a reminder there, if you look at what was budgeted last year versus this year, that's a decrease. Uh, get everybody calling up. Nope, just I'm sorry. a moment. No, it's fine. You're fine. Uh, so sanitation, zero, zero, fourteen. Yes. And uh, even though the, the Jill and I talked about this afternoon and, and we feel confident that, that uh, we may have had a little blown number in 2019, the actual salaries uh, are down a little bit from last year uh, as far as budgeted. And please note that that does include uh, converting those four existing positions to crew leaders, which is a, a impact of $8,320 to the budget. So um, the, feel good about that. Everything else, again, uh, really nothing to point out to you. Um, you know, we do have uh, the, the, the landfill charges are a little bit uh, uh, reflective out there. It looks like our, our project is about 288 and we're still holding it 350, but that's just one of those things is that it's a hard one to gauge because we're adding anywhere between 20 and 30 new customers a month. So we, we know our tonnage goes up every month that goes forward. We just don't really can get a handle on that growth rate. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been very efficient with the equipment that you have provided for us. Um, and probably the biggest thing for you to consider um, when you go to the detail of the uh, 50470 account, which is uh, capital equipment. Uh, there are four pieces of solid waste equipment that are listed there that show zero impact the budget. Uh, this is, as you know, uh, and Kim has been very uh, helpful in this area as well. Uh, this is equipment that we recommend that we procure, that we procure it through a three-year lease to own through a local bank. Here, here is here is the the reality that we're living in. If if this any piece of these equipments are included in this budget and we order it as soon as the budget is passed, we have been seeing a trend of anywhere from 14 to 18 months before it's physically delivered here. That's that's the reality of the marketplace out there. And the problem is we don't need this equipment today, but we are going to need this equipment in a year and a half. That that is that is that is the challenge that we're dealing with. The other thing is the leases are due in arrears. So if it's delivered 14 months from the time that the budget is passed and the lease is instituted, the first payment is not due to 12 months after that closing of the, of the delivery of the equipment. So Kim is very mindful of future budget impacts and we're gonna have to be mindful of that too. But we are recommending uh, th those procurement. If there needs to be one dropped off, one of the trash trucks uh, could be sacrificial. Uh, and we'll visit again next budget year. Uh, I do want to note that we've got a real problem with our landfill. We're using a, a pretty light duty D5 uh, bulldozer. Uh, that's not that old, but we are, we are, it, it's having issues because it's, it's repeatedly sustaining damage and we're recommending replacing it with a, a D6 with the landfill package on it. And we feel pretty strongly that the, the value and we got CAT to kind of give us a, a value 
of the D6 is between 55 and 75 thousand uh, dollars, or the D5 that we would replace, uh, be replaced by the D6, and you know that would help offset that budgetary cost of servicing that uh, that that lease to own is purchase. Is that really necessary? A year or two ago, and, and, and after pressing uh, the person, they didn't feel that the high wheel was absolutely necessary. Well, the, the challenge that I understand, and, and you know, as you know, our mechanical maintenance supervisor was, was very uh, involved with Caterpillar as an employee for many years before he came to work for us. The, the, to get a bulldozer that has a landfill protection package on it, that's the skid plates, the grill protection, the cab protection, everything else, uh, you've got to go to the D6 model. And and his comment to me was, I'm going to take him as expert, is if you're going to go to the D6, go to the high wheel, uh, because that's what it's designed for that type of service life. And, uh, you know, my position is this is a 15 to 20 year purchase, meaning that, that if we take care of this piece of equipment, it's the right equipment for the job, uh, it sees that landfill to close out. Uh, and that there's no, no need uh, that that piece of equipment should be replaced in, in my career lap, lifetime with the city. Um, again, we can continue to use the piece of equipment we have, and if that's something that has to be uh, taken out of the budget, uh, we understand. Uh, again, as I told the mayor, if, I, if, if it's not a loss if I never had it in the first place, but we are using the wrong piece of equipment uh, that's not heavy duty enough and does not have the equipment protection for the limb pushing and things that we're doing and we have replaced parts on that tri uh, on that that bulldozer we probably shouldn't have but because we're not using it for the right application uh, it's a machine designed for grading and site work and things of that nature so council I just added up all the it's about 300,000 per year well, it was seven hundred and six thousand dollars if you only count the one year payment, the first year payment of the bulldozer. Were those payments, uh, Jimmy? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm counting all all four of the pieces on lease. And I'm coming up with right around three hundred thousand a year. I put the, the total cost. Years. In. I put the total cost in at seven for the first three, and then for the last one, I put just one payment. I didn't. You got it by year. How much? Yeah, it was. It was four items. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right around three hundred. It was ninety-four. Then there were two at about fifty, and then the last one was well, two hundred. About about three three thirty-one, somewhere right around there. Yeah. Sorry, I just got that. Thirty-one hundred. We're talking about. Uh, <coughs> A garbage truck, two trash trucks, and a and a D6 dozer uh, with landfill operations. Four hundred and thirty-five thousand. Yeah. Four hundred and thirty-five thousand a year for the next several years. It would have to be budgeted. Or two hundred. No, three thirty-one. Uh, yeah, that sounds yeah. more more like three thirty-one. It's ninety-five. It's basically ninety-five, fifty-five, oh, fifty-five, mm -hmm. one thirty-five. Mm -hmm. And three thirty-five. I haven't pictured it. That extra hundred thousand. So what other, um, I guess we need to see what other departments do we have, do we have leases in and, and kind of have an idea of what we would be committing to overall because that, that, you know, it shows up as, you know, zeros this year. Right. And, and then may even show up as zeros next year, depending upon when, the when time you get it. Delivered, yeah. but, but, but you're committed to what we have road. to talk about now because he's putting in here based on demand and doing two days a week. So... This is when you also talk about one day a week. And then you wouldn't need if you went to one day a week, what would your what would it need? If we went to one day a week, basically we we probably could freeze the procurement of now this you know, understand one day a week only affects the garbage operation. So that's Correct. that's the, the top line. That is the auto garbage truck. Uh, one day a week would probably freeze purchasing of garbage trucks for several, several years because understand okay. is that if you think about a route and we divide it, you know, we, we visit every resi residential unit twice a week. So basically you theoretically have twice the number of trucks that you actually need to visit twice a week. Um, 
but also remember if you go to one day a week, the volume doesn't change, meaning that people throw away what they throw away in a given week. They may divide it in two halves, they may only put their can out once a week, whatever. Volume doesn't change. So you, so the, the, it's, it's not a complete one for one exchange, meaning, but you do get the efficiency of the fact that you're not putting as many miles on the truck and theoretically not as many hours because you still have to drive by every residence whether there's a can out but your volume is, is going to be the same and continue to grow based upon customer growth. So what is what is what does that project your current fleet out to? It probably gives you a 33% instant boost, meaning that that not not 50 not 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 a half, but but a third projection forward, and meaning that you you probably could freeze and not have to replace anything or have to buy anything for several budget cycles. That that would be you know without spending some detail analysis on it. Um, Um, another way to look at those numbers, if you went with all four of those mm -hmm. capital purchases, would be uh, if it was an annual cost of 335 and if I just go back to the bulldozer and make them three payments on it, but buying the others outright, you're at 706000 you could almost you know, budget it over two years and have, Same know, have everything paid yeah. for except the dozer. And so you know, that's another way to look at it. And uh, you know, and and of course, these are listed in order operations. If if we had to make, uh, you know, per your guidance, a garbage truck and a trash truck, and then we we can always hold the other two items to discuss this time next year. I mean, nothing. You know, again, we can continue to do what we're doing with the bulldozer we have, and and deal with the with the the associated challenges with that. And uh, you know, again. Right now, today, we have enough trash truck capacity. Our concern is a year from the day. And so the, the, the challenge that we have is we got to order knowing that right now the lead time on delivery is anywhere from 14 to uh, 18 months. And just to give you a perspective, we just took delivery of a 2017 budgeted garbage truck. Okay, so just to kind of give you that these are just real world factors that uh, business is good out there for the manufacturers and you get in line, so. I don't, I, don't, I don't disagree that it doesn't need to be in the budget, but for planning purposes, it worries me a little bit that it's not at some number, some placeholders not in the budget because when you get to next year and it goes up by $350,000, we're gonna be saying, uh oh, where do we cut to fit that in? It, it, I, I just, even if we don't spend a nickel, I, I kind of wish we had a, a line in there or actually bump that line up to something more reasonable. And I, I consider all those leases to be debt too, so, I mean, I know we were trying to. They don't go as debt on the books, but. Well, and that's why I was trying to spread it over uh, two years and you don't know. Right, and in your third year, you don't have that. You don't have any payment. Yeah. The third, year, that lasts what four or five years. Uh, our, our front line garbage truck. Our goal is seven years on the front line and at least a year uh, to two years in reserve capacity. So were these all leased to own? Yes, um, you know, and and no more than a three. We we, it was, it was amazing uh, on the bulldozer. The five year cost more. <laughs> Than the three, than the, or, than the four years. So I didn't even put that on there. <laughs> it wasn't even an option. So, um, yes, uh, all these are are zero payment at the conclusion of the last lease payment, meaning you own it outright. It's a finance dome. Yeah. And and I and I do know that Kim is highly aware of our commitments, and 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 I don't know how how we best keep you guys informed of where we're, our commitments when they come due and that kind of thing. But they, they, they are there and they will be incorporated into budgets if we go forward and we'll have to, you know, um, uh, account for those well, at that time. Let me ask you this, and, 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 and if, you, if you're talking that we would order something now and not realize that cost for a year, year and a half, yeah. two years, are there any purchases that need to be showing up in here as expenditures that were for orders that were made a year or a year and a half ago? Um, that yeah, so meaning that, that this oh, time next paying. year, well, that, but that's the debt that's service on the truck we just got will be accounted for in the budget. That's the correct statement. So, yeah. So, I mean, we, we are going to be, you know, the piper will be paid, but you, we can't show it in the budget until we, it, it's physically due. And, uh, 
uh, it's been a it's been a tough thing to manage because it, it sure looks rosy on paper, but yeah, the, the, yeah, is the that going to be due in the next what? It's going to be a transfer. You'll see it as a transfer going out to um, lease. It's in the budget. Like the trucks that have just come in this year, since I've been here, there's been three trucks to come in. One of those trucks, we're just not doing the financing, so you won't see it on this year, but you'll see transfers going out to capital lease payments because those are set up as, as a debt mm -hmm. into a separate fund and we'll be transferring those at, monies out. So, yeah, if you, if you look at the budget actuals for 2019, it's 77000 Is that real? And then for 2020, the proposal is 34200 I gotta believe we're blowing those numbers out of the water. Well, and and that's uh, and that's kind of a Kim and Jill way to explain it. But when you look at the we're well, all I can do is is say this is the need and this is the recommendation. But what you're seeing in in, in those numbers is that you're seeing a outright purchase of an F two fifty and uh, a five thousand dollars for an eight hundred pound capacity ice maker. And I'm trying to think what else that adds up to 33,000. Uh, and we need to find out where the, there's 1200 and then there's $1,200 for the new network switches. So that's where you add those three numbers that comes up to that. That's where that number came from. So, um, and the sanitation department needs 800 pounds of ice per day for what? We don't have access to an ice maker right now. The one that was uh, in the in the outdoor garage died. So um, and gas is getting mad at us for robbing all their ice on a regular basis. So um, and it is hot out there during the summertime. I think that I think that the. Purchasing vehicles and equipment number looks kind of lean. I'm concerned that's going to come in when these bills hit. That number is not going to be real. Yeah, I see some <coughs> stuff sitting in encumbrances and wrecks um, out there in the system. It's just an outstanding purchase order that has been made, but I don't know. Kim, have you seen invoices come in for those? So that 77, you know, I had to take it as of the time the budget was put together, but I think we've had some <coughs> stuff transpire since, so definitely need to look at that 77. We yeah, I think that, it, that it, number's got to be, it got, definitely got to be massaged. And then, like I said, do we, do we, and then you look at our, well, actually, it'd make, it'd make the 2020 numbers look better. Um, I, I, I guess that we have enough money to cover the 2019 <coughs> actuals. But because we know we're going to have some orders from previous years show up in 2020, I don't think the 34 2 is necessarily a reasonable number. Yeah, we're going to look at both of those. We'll get with Kim and see what invoices have come in, if we've had any invoices come in. Richard, back to the, uh, I'll change the gears again. On the landfill charges, mm -hmm. our, our 2019 projected actual is pretty good c compared to, to budget. But is that just uncertainty in the market that that goes back <coughs> up to the to 2019 budgeted number, roughly? Yeah, I, th I think there's a little sandbagging on our part on that. I mean, just feel, uh, yeah. just for whatever reason, it yeah. was low this year and want to kind of keep that budget number high. Yeah. And that's one of those. It is, and it's you know be what it is. You know you're seeing about uh, you know that four to five percent growth, which is about what our customer growth rate is, which the tonnage should be reflective of that. And the good news is, with at least the the county landfills, those are pretty set prices that don't fluctuate. So well, the but the proposed budget number over the actual is a twenty one and a half percent increase. Yeah, and I, I think that is just a a. A cautionary number. I mean, it's one of those things. It, it, you know, in council, this is one of those things that you hate to say it. The the the, the amount of garbage that we collect, solid waste that has to be landfilled, is 
is going to be what it is. We cannot, you know. So it, so again, if that's a number that you would, you know, say, hey, the trend looks like it's increasing about twenty five thousand dollars a year, and it looks like it needs to be three oh five or whatever. Again, there's no there's no punitive damage to us if we pick that number because at the end of the day, whatever we take across the scales is what what we're going to pay. Well, actually, our twenty nineteen actuals are almost equal to our twenty seventeen actuals. And I don't know if that's a trend of less waste, maybe more recycling. Better diversion, yeah. Um, and Jill, she explained this to me one time, and apparently I wasn't a good student. The, the projected, how does the computer come up with that number? Is it just looking at a trend line? It's, it's a trend, and then you add however many days are left. Okay. I guess looking at encumbrances and the racks that are sitting out there. Okay. It's not exact, but it's. You know, so in 19, our actuals was 267. It looks like we're heading for 288. So that's about a $20,000 increase, which when you think about our growth of our, our customer base, that's probably right in line with that growth line. You know, it's a reduction from 2018, which is, which is a good trend. Yeah, I didn't even look. I didn't go all that. Yeah, go to your I don't know what we did in 2018. We were 294. <laughs> 294. Yeah. Uh, we did start in 2019 giving away the recycled with the, you know, in other words, you don't have to, to ask for it. You get it with your garbage can. Yeah. I so I think that us. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just looking really, at That's something really positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right about. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the, the fact that we're growing and our tonnage is not reflecting that, that, that means we've got good stewards of, uh, at, at our, at for our customers. Yeah. Quite possible as a part of it. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. definitely. And again, I, if that's one of those numbers that, that we can massage, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, there's a harm in doing that. So. Yeah, we can lower that. Well, and I'm trying to, trying to help you because I'm kind of thinking that that purchases a vehicle and equipment is going to need to go up. Very good. Yes, sir. Might want to help yourself out. Of course, as soon as we do that, it'll, the landfill charges will go up 20%. And I'll blame Jay for lowering the number of expenses. Fair enough. So uh, there's savings if you go to one day a week besides just the extended um, wear or extended time on the vehicles? I mean, Most days for people complain we, about. We wouldn't buy charges. another. I mean, the. the the purchase would go down about right. thirty percent. Right, but what about time. the operation? I mean, well, people, fuel. I mean, and, and let's let's have the the obvious conversation. Yeah. Um, is, is that uh, if you went to two day from two days a week residential service to one day, you automatically wake up and you have a garbage workforce that is too big for the demand. Because I understand. We are auto operation, meaning that, that, that there's one man in a truck running an auto collection system. Now, the, 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 the fact is, is that now where you've had two days to visit every customer, you have four days, okay? So you have that, that one man, that one man unit and one man unit truck has twice the ability, eight hours a day, 16 additional hours in a week. So then the question is, what do you do with this workforce? Well, I went through this in Daphne, and, and we were able to absorb them, meaning that when, when openings came in other departments, those individuals were transferred, and we, we shrunk the workforce, okay? We didn't lay anybody off. We didn't rift anybody. We absorbed them, parks and rec, wherever, you know, try to get them placed to, to do that. In time, you, you theoretically, by going to one day, would shrink your workforce in the garbage section by some calculated percentage based upon you know because I understand is that the same employee today has to visit on his route his routes houses twice where all of a sudden he's only gonna have one so he's got four days to do what he used to have to do in two days now here's the here's the challenge he's gonna have more cycles back to the transfer station because his trucks gonna fill up faster because mm -hmm. theoretically he's gonna have the same volume um, and, you know, so so you you got to you got to look at it. So it's not it's not a one for one exchange, but there right. is definitely a potential for reduction there. Um, and you know, this is one of those. I mean, I'm proud to say that I, I think we we work very hard, and I think we achieve a high quality service to our customers. 
and I will tell you twice a week is a luxury in most communities because I, I can't name too terribly many. I think the the last one in Baldwin County is Bay Manette, and there's rumor they're getting ready to go to once a week, okay? Now, I don't have that confirmed. Um, and, you know, you have to you have to reach out and, and weigh hearts and mind. I have once a week where I live, and my wife and I know that shrimp shells go in the freezer in a bag, and you put them in the morning of the, uh, pickup day, because if you put them in seven days in August, your, your can's going to stink, okay? Mm -hmm. You got to, you, you know, but... but I, I, know, I think that this council and the mayor and everybody at this table is a good cross-section of our community. I'd like to hear what, you know, and I, what, what your garbage pickup looks like. I'll start. M mine is, sometimes I don't put my garbage can out one day a week. Sometimes I only need to try. I mean, of course, Christmas is, you know, things like holidays are exceptions. We could, we could add on Christmas. But, yeah, but I truly, my garbage can is, is sometimes it's full, sometimes it's not. Uh, Friday, I didn't even have to put it out. I don't even think there was a bag in there. Um, my recycling load has increased uh, considerably. Uh, you know, I usually have two, one I just donated, it's a great big huge bucket with a Fairhope recycling sticker on it. It's full almost every week and so is the smaller bin. So I know that we've converted over to more recycling, but I do have concerns about tipping fees on recycling now as well and what's going on with all of that. If that's really, you know, trying to be a good steward, is it really going to where it's supposed to go? But I'd like to hear from everybody else what, what their garbage is. I would say 90% of the time we only put out once a week. And when we do, we still don't even fill it up. So, 90% of the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably very rarely do I take it out twice a week because it's not full. Okay. You're I like, got, I have a baby. You have okay. how much trash you did. I've got a lot of garbage. In <laughs> you have a baby. And, and it's dirty diapers and it smells. And I <laughs> Can you put them in the freezer, though? <laughs> I wouldn't well, recommend that. We've not gone baggy freezer optional dirty diapers. <laughs> I have five cats. We don't take anything off the table. So it's a struggle. But I, uh, when we lived on pier, once a week, occasionally twice, but if once a week. We, if we don't, and we don't always remember, we do forget sometimes to take it out that second day. Um, and if we do, we are, we have a backlog. What size receptacle do you have? The larger the or the smaller? The large. You have the large. And what about your recycling? My wife handles that. <laughs> there we go. There, go. there think, we go. I think this would incentivize more recycling. Out buckets in my yard. Uh, Our lid was pretty much straight up in the air from all the garbage. It wouldn't close. But we have once Twice a week. week. Once a week. Once a week. Mayor, watch you. You, uh, Mine's mostly once a week, but I mean, ours is commercial now, now that I live upstairs, so yeah. I mean, we pick up every day. Yeah, and, and with our backdoor service in the Central Business District, that, that service is... Is going to your commercial pickup? No, I'm just saying... She pays it all more is, for it. It's, it's, all, it's all part <laughs> of <laughs> the same... Commercial rate's higher than residential, of, so... Uh, uh, garbage cans, but it's, it's all... Uh, it's mostly commercial. You know, and, and I, I don't think that's something that has to be discussed today, but I'll be glad to try to put some things out on paper and kind of show you, you know, what it, what the ramifications of that transition and, and what the potential uh, savings, and there, there will be operation savings. I understand the, you know, the, the rolling hours on those pieces of equipment. I mean, if you, the mayor's had this, this experience of becoming mayor, is if you want to know what a brake job on a, a 28 or 24 yard garbage truck is and understand it goes through about four sets of brakes a year, okay? Well, all of a sudden, if you're not visiting every house twice a week, you're only doing it once a week, you're gonna have some inherent savings. Those, those brake pads and those wear items are gonna last longer. And, and I think the average truck runs about $4,500 just in parts to, 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 to reissue them. Uh, that, that is a reality. And if you're doing that four times a year and all of a sudden it drops to three or two and a half, there's an inherent savings there. If you can reduce, you know, as, and, and I don't want to scare people watching and listening, uh, especially employees, if, if you can have a reduction in force through attrition and all of a sudden your garbage staff goes from X to X minus 33%, as you know, the driver and our operation expenses are salaries and all the benefits go with it. So that, that, that would be a savings that would come with time. Um, in that uh, department, is that part of your higher turnover? Uh, generally, sanitation has a, a high turnover because the starting level jobs there aren't 
aren't right. luxury jobs i'll just tell you and, and it's not for everybody but yeah but understand you know trash and recycle is not impacted by this L landfill and transfer is not impacted because the volume doesn't change you're just it's the, the number of times that you go to pick up that same volume volume is the same it's just i think recycling will increase uh, uh, yes i think it might yeah. if you go to yeah. i think so and and, and, and i'll tell you make up room somewhere else uh, uh, no. my our past experience my past experience is when that transition occurred we one made sure your garbage and your recycle day wasn't the same day so our comment was we do give you still twice a week service right. you have recycle on one day you have garbage on the other and if you're careful you know just if you really look at your garbage string how much of it's actually recyclable you you get twice a week service at the curbside and uh, they tend to bought that argument pretty good now you know I'm not going to say that there weren't folks that were upset and, and there was a little heat that came a, a part of that when that conversion take place but you know after a year no one remembered twice a week garbage I mean you know and and I'll tell you if you have a 96 gallon can I've got a family of five uh, I, I think Christmas is about the only time that it's it's full uh, you know the rest of the time it's usually less than three quarters full uh, at the most so well, uh, my cans out there every Sunday and every third on Wednesday. Full? No, sir. Not even close. So you my wife religiously you takes that out there for the dirty doctors in the front. <laughs> <laughs> you have to that, that you have to talk to my wife about it. She does take it out there every night on Sunday third, but it's never full. I don't see the reason why we, you know. And then sometimes we won't take it because there's really nothing in it. But, How about your cycle? It's going to add, I can tell you that we're going to start putting a whole lot more to make sure we it cost, have it. But yeah, hey, all you got to do is get a bigger, bike, bigger container. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with with the trend right now, yeah, recycling is a little expensive to process. It's but to recycle, so it, it, it'll from. cost us to fill our well, landfill, too. I'm very concerned with yeah. the tipping yeah. fees for recycling. Uh, no, I'm very concerned with that. But, uh, I think our landfill is more valuable. Well, it's 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 a tough thing. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be too, the glass is half full, but, but you know, they keep telling us that that, that, that pattern is going to reverse. They, you know, unfortunately, they said about 18 months, 18 months ago, it hadn't happened yet. So <laughs> maybe, you know, may, maybe we see a change there. By no means am I wishing for fuel costs to go up because that's one of the lower fuel costs makes recycle harder to recycle. But uh, uh, hopefully we'll see at least a moderation and maybe a change in the other direction. Are, are there. we playing those commodities now? Say, are we, are we stockpiling our plastics or our paper or our metals waiting for the market to go up? Uh, generally on, on definitely on the cardboard right now because but but it's still it's at $45 a ton I think and we were at 125 ton a year and a half ago so but you have a certain capacity and the good news is we do have a buyer for our cardboard our metals we do fine with I was watching them load the bins today and, and that that's bringing in uh, reasonable good money and, and that market seems to be steady the, the plastics are going to ECUA because one good thing about plastic, it's light. So if we're paying per ton, that's one of the lightest materials in there. If we can get the heavy stuff out, metals and, and it's uh, going to where? To ECUA's uh, MRF over in Cantonment. What is that? It's, it's their recycle. That's who we have it's the contract. Right? Yes. Uh, okay. And they're I, buying it or we just have it? No, it? we're paying them to take we're it right now. To take our yes, product. yes. Uh, and other mixed recycles that, that, that don't have a market out there on the commodity. There, there, there is a value for all this, though. Guys that clean the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> sold 500,000 500, tons of uh, HDP plastic. I saw yeah, that, yeah. Uh, bracelets and necklaces. Yeah, yeah we, we have those bracelets. Well, um, so plastic market, no end in sight for that? No. Um, and, you know, and. and uh, so we're just recycling that. We're, we're, we are, we are being good stewards of the environment. Well, I, was having, I saw a story where some of the foreign countries stopped receiving it. Yes. That, that's so much plastic they and can't take it they're changing mm -hmm. policy, too. Yeah. That will, uh, I think, eventually happen. What's paper doing? Uh, mixed paper is not worth the hoop, but it's it's about it's it's neutral, meaning they'll take it, but they don't give us anything. The only for thing us. we're having to pay then is for plastic. 
Well, right. what we consider the the, the, the single stream, this the, the the oddball stuff that may have the Walmart bags in it, the film, things that are problematic. We're we're keeping glass pretty much out of out of the stream, and we've got a process for that. The worst case on glass has been we had to pay the freight to get it hauled to Atlanta, which wasn't terribly bad. Um, the time before that, it was a even Stephen deal, meaning they hauled it off and they didn't pay us anything, and we didn't pay them anything. So. Uh, and but the nice thing about glass, we can stockpile it. It's inert. It can sit outside. It doesn't get harmed by the weather, and we can wait until we get a, the best deal we can get on that. So, so, so it sounds like the recycling is still working, and we're just not making, we're not offsetting no. the cost as much as we used to. But it's, it's certainly cheaper than filling mm -hmm. a landfill. I just think it's right. well, it the, has a, a value that you might not be able to see yeah. in dollars and cents, but it has a, a very big value. You know, we're we're. We're in, as, as Mr. Brown pointed out, we're kind of in that gray area of what is socially and environmentally responsible to what compared is, is, is financially responsible. I, I will tell you, if you said, Richard, recommend what we do based purely on the bottom line, it would be cheaper to take our recyclables that we're taking to ECUA to take them to Magnolia Landfill and landfill them. But the problem is that is not socially or environmentally that's responsible. Really so uh, that, that is the... But that's the only item, though, right? It, that's it, the it, only it, Well, it, it, plastics is, 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 is from a volume standpoint, and plastic takes up a lot of volume. It doesn't have any weight to it. Um, but... Uh, you know, part of our goal is to be as responsible is trying to not handle the material any more than necessary because when you start tying a lot of labor into that, then you're just digging the hole deeper for you. So we're trying to be efficient in, in that process. Well, well back to that on, on a bigger picture, I mean, at the rate that uh, the city's growing and the surrounding area is growing, if we continue with the two-day-a-week service, it won't be long before you've hit capacity there and then you're adding additional staff and team in order to continue providing two days a week service well that that's what you're seeing the driver here is you're seeing an ask for a garbage truck it's a very expensive piece of equipment and and we're asking for it today because we realize that it does come online to probably in real realistically earliest 12 months from the day and realistically 18 months from the day when we know that we've got to a piece of equipment that is at the end of its service life that needs to be replaced and everything else. At this point in time, uh, we, I, haven't, I haven't spent too much time looking at 2021, 2022. Uh, these are replacement equipment that we're talking about here. Uh, we're not adding personnel to go with them, but yes, uh, the the reality of it is is that as we add customers, and you know, over time is a is a is a big number in this, and and part of that growth that we deal with ends up being covered by overtime, and there's a point in time that overtime is cheaper than adding a person, okay, but eventually overtime starts not being the better value to adding the person, so you you know that's where we we'll sit down with you at that time and say. All right, we've got to add staff in this area because we have 240 more customers than we did a year ago, and we have 480 more than we did two years ago, and, and we've got to establish another route. And, you know, and just to kind of give you an idea, the typical maximum number that one person and one truck can handle is about that 700 to 800 a day so if you start looking our you know and, and there was one point in time we had I think in 2017 we had 400 customers so if we stayed on that trend that means that we were you know we were needing one more day after two years of a truck and a person and you know we cover that by spreading the route out spanning this route contracting that one based upon number of customers and running that route to its complete which may run into an hour or two of overtime on that shift until until that service is complete you have made this very interesting that we have talked this long about garbage pickup well i, I you know it's fascinating and, and i think all it. you gentlemen and and ladies at the table it, it, it's 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 a puzzle you know how how you know because the most interesting thing is that if if we're if we're building a new sidewalk and we get to a point in the time of the day, we say, okay, we'll stop here and we'll pick up on it tomorrow. Well, the problem is if, if this route is due to be picked on Monday, we don't have the option to say, oh, we'll get to it Tuesday. Because what happens Tuesday is Tuesday's route has to be picked up. <laughs> so every day, sanitation wakes up and they know what they have to get done. 
Trash is a little more flexible. If we didn't get to you, we'll pick right up where we left off the next day. But garbage, you know, it's it's pretty. Uh, it's you know, again, customers expect to be serviced, and if we miss them, boy, we'll hear from them. <laughs> I want to give you guys another tidbit. Yeah, <coughs> already. The net loss from the sanitation is 18 percent. So. And, and and that's with no that's not with the that's, that's with the purchases of vehicles and equipment being that really no low number you know, the landfill charges being maybe a high number but I, I think the purchase of the vehicle and equipment is going to be much much higher than, than that and so you throw in say 77 plus 330 the next year then you're at 400 plus mm -hmm. additional 400 plus negative to the bottom line. You'd be at a, you know, over a 30, you'd be about a 35% loss. I think, I think That's why I think really this is an inevitable decision yeah. that needs to be made. And yeah. Councilman Brown, I, you're a man after my own heart because I have it right here. Right now, based upon these budget numbers, our income is roughly 82% of our operating cost. I will tell you that municipal sanitation should be close to 90%. Now, why you say 90? Well, understand 10% of what that department does is not directly related to sanitation. They support special events, they parades, Mardi Gras. They, heck, we got guys that help clean bathrooms on weekends and do park services and things like that. So we got to understand there's a 10% value of their service to the greater city least, that's not directly think. related to customer service, and. Uh, you know, I didn't want to bring this up, but I did a little little thing that 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 probably this time next year, uh, you would have me back here suggesting a, a a another rolling increase that's much smaller than the last one. That if you did approximately 50 cents per year for 2021, 2022, 2023, and we can hold budgetary numbers, is that by 2023, based upon a modest growth of 20 customers per month. We would be at roughly 93% of uh, income to actual expenses, which is where we probably need to be. Mm -hmm. And the garbage fee in 2023 would be $17.30, which would still be generally in the midpoint range of what uh, comparable communities throughout our area pay. So, pardon? 17 what? 1730. So if you if you went 50 cents up in 2021, it'd take you to 1630. Then another 50 cents in 2022 would be 1680. And then another 50 cents in 2023 would give you 1730. And my projection, we'd be around about 11,000 customers at that point in time at the at a conservative growth rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so a buck 50 over 1580? Correct. Roughly 10%. I'd be fine with a one time increase. I know. Well, we just finished, or this is the third year uh, yes. for a dollar. Yes. I understand that, but I mean, it's a service. It's not a, it's not a free service as we see. No, and I, I, and I think it's a valued service. Even, but yeah. I think right. that the, one, the once a week is going to maintain those costs. Yeah, I'd I think that's that inevitable. I mean, that, I, I that's going to. I think gonna, we're headed there, too. Yeah. I mean, well, and, and the only thing I would say there is, and, and I think that Dale and I need to sit down and, and kind of kind of draw a flow chart of what that would look like in the timeline. You know, one, you've you got to have an outreach, you got to have an education, you got to establish your routes and things of that nature, divide everything back, redivide everything back up. But I'll be glad to do some homework, get you all something back. I, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to, in this budget process to take this into consideration now because I think there needs to be some some you you need to have expectation that we're going to do some good planning some for good feasibility some good forecasting bring you back something that's measurable as far as metrics and numbers and 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 y'all kind of value check those to make sure we're not being too optimistic or too pessimistic but it, it's definitely something to look at as a planning tool and for a future budgetary tool I think that it the only thing it'll affect right now for this year would be just the future purchases I, or when those purchases yeah. will hit I, I, we're going to be at an over 20 percent loss I and mean, we're going to be at a 25 percent loss yep. the mayor can i ask you to uh or can we collectively maybe ask you to uh, maybe do some kind of survey uh you know ask people to be honest and say how how often you know right. are your cans full or how often do you 
I think you, you need to. I know it's going to be a change. If people ask if they're going to get an open order. Exactly. I think you took a couple with that. Yeah. We'd rather see an increase or go to one day. I'd much rather go to one day. Right. Because that's. I have no problem going one day. Making that work. People are funny about the garbage. Are y'all? No. Yeah, but I think we can do that internally. It's going to create a stir, but we have to have. And you know, I, I will tell you that that was a pretty immediate effect. And uh, Daphne went to once a day in, in 2010, and I think the first three years um, there was a, a net income of average about 225,000 coming back to the general fund from the solid waste enterprise. Then, of course, as you know, diesel fuel went out the out the uh, window and everything else, and that. And but they were able to. Uh, there, they did not do a fee increase for over almost like 10 years, uh, and being able to absorb it by going to once a day, and then they started running a deficit and had to, to look at you know adjusting fees. But there is, there there will be a savings in operational cost, and of ultimately if you if you do it and make sure you 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 protect your employees, but get them homes in other parts of public works and you know public utilities where they're qualified over a period of time to transition them, you will realize that savings. And again, I think we can, uh, the one guarantee, whatever y'all decide, you know, we, we will work as hard as we can to ensure quality service to our customers. I mean, that's what we're going to do. And uh, you can give great service once a day and uh, once a week uh, as opposed to twice and uh, um, be effective in that operation. Do you think that it could potentially, if we go down once a week since we just did a three-year one dollar increase but of course it hadn't been increased in a while could we lower it a little or is it just probably where it needs to be for once or twice a week well and if you know if if the easy comparison is baldwin county right now it's 16 bucks a week you get once a week and twice a quarter trash no recycle I mean, there are 16s. We're at 1580 right now. We're giving them twice a week and once a week trash and, and recycle. I think that if we go to once a week, then we would need to hold the current fee and, and let the budget normalize, let the staff be uh, adjusted over time and, and be able to evaluate <laughs> operational costs, wear and tear, and things like that. <coughs> and I think you'll probably find that we're, we're pretty much close to being where we need to be, at least in the foreseeable future. All right, Council, we've got about maybe five or six minutes. We need to adjourn so we can start our meeting on time. we got five or six minutes, but uh, does anybody have any important committee updates? Well, I'm give them during this. Yeah. You can, address, you can address that in your council comments. Anybody have any budget comments? I've got those sheets I handed out. Everybody should have a paper put together. Two that are stapled together. The last is just a sheet that was emailed from the mayor with the account balances. I mentioned the last meeting. You know, just kind of the trend, looking back over the, you know, the, this year's budget and then looking back at previous budgets of where the city is heading, revenue versus expenses. You get that first sheet that says general government budget versus actual analysis for 2020. <clears throat> I tried to simplify it a little bit. This is this is only operational. I didn't get into appropriations. This is strictly operational for the years listed there. Uh, numbers are all given on previous budgets and this year's budget as far as what the budget numbers and the actual for both revenues and expenses. And basically it's showing uh, on that first sheet is from 2017 to 2019, we budgeted revenues uh, at a rate of 9.25% increase and they've only grown at 5.5. So our revenues have been roughly half of what we projected they should be in our budgets. And expenses, the uh, budget has gone up in, from 17 to 19, 17%. And the actual has been 15.6 so you know, difference of I was just gonna say it does need more explanation but I mean the, the budget and the um, the revenue has been increasing every year so just because it missed the budget doesn't mean that we're not doing well we are increasing and balancing the budget every year 
including the year that it shows that we're a negative. But did y'all get my my um, my email and, and had read comments about? Well, I mean, you look. Yeah. So to your point, Mayor, if you look okay. down at that bottom line, where I've got expense versus revenue actual. That's basically what the actual revenue versus expense, what the balance was at the end of the year. So 2017, you know, we were five million under budget. But, you know, that goes back to a lot of capital projects that might not have gotten done or purchases weren't done that year or, or whatever, but just the actual revenue versus actual expense, that's what was left. And you can see that going across. So those numbers look good. I'm just looking at the, the uh, actual numbers and budget numbers and their trend. But, but but looking at budget numbers and actual numbers, you need to look at the trend for actual numbers because these actual numbers are the city taking on its own expenses and weaning off the profits from the utility, and that's not going to be reflected in this. A, a budget is just that. I mean, and if you're going to be off and you're going to be running at a huge deficit, that's one thing. But we are balancing every single year. These, these actual numbers reflect that change, right? From 2017, 18, and 19, all the expenses were recategorized. Right. Right. And, but the transfer, for example, from utilities in 2019 includes the purchase of the K-1 center. So that's not operating expense. That's actually purchasing something for community development. So that's why these figures have to be identified a little bit more. And I did send you all the notes from what council, uh, what you put together, uh, Councilman Conyers, um, to show you, and I emailed it to you all, I'm not sure if you looked at it. It had my notes in red. Was that, how, was that today or? or oh, no, that was after the last meeting. Okay. Um, but basically broke down, you know, th there's a difference in showing a transfer from utility that's going to operating the city budget and transferring from utilities to make a purchase like the K-1 Center. I mean, they're, it's two different expenses. So you can't just, just compare it to expenses and revenue. Well, I, I, I agree, and that's kind of why I sent you that email about the, the sales tax revenue. You know, where is it? And you responded to us in operating. Right. The, the only difference now is that when, when you had an appropriate or, or a reserve for capital purchases, I mean, all of that's doing is it's going to capital purchases when we're ready to make the purchase. It's not a necessary earmark. Sales tax income for almost every municipality is the number one source of income, and that is used to operate the budget. Now that debt has been paid off, any capital purchase that is in our budget can be paid out of the operating expense. When you earmark it and then you transfer that money out, and I think Kim can probably tra you know explain this better, it, it, it affects the bottom line. I mean, I, I, I guess it's just a municipal accounting thing, but I mean, what you have in the 2020 budget is the sales tax is going to operating, you know, the, the whole the whole budget, and it is balanced based on that. Um, Again, having earmarks for this and that, I, I recommend that if we had any, anything for sales tax, it would be reinvesting in the things that increase sales tax. Um, because when you do that, then you're going to hopefully ensure that you'll have a better result with those increases. But as far as looking at year-to-year -year budget, that's, that's how the budgets were done in the past. Looking at we budgeted this compared to what we budgeted in the next year, that's not the way you do a budget. It's all on actuals. You know, and you, you evaluate where you're off, but those things were never done in the past until this term. It's all about giving y'all all the numbers, but you gotta look at actuals and actuals. But I think okay. that uh, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the trends of actuals and I'm looking at the revenues going up five and a half percent in the last, you know, four years. And I see any expenses going up 15.6 so not exactly uh, a three times ratio or a three to one ratio on the actual expense curve versus the revenue curve so the, the 
I don't know if this is what you were trying to say, but it's a little bit concerning that the expense curve is three times as steep as the revenue curve. And I, I also don't know if this is what you're trying to say, Robert, but I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But when you, when you take the money that was going to debt prepayment and then you put it into operating, you know, that was that was that was a, a really a, a cushion, and it was something that I, I was hoping that when we got the debt paid off, we could we could put back into the city you know, for people to enjoy. And, and you know, it's a well, lot of it you, you got to get it back to that cost. point. I mean, you, you when you've you've taken, and that's why you've got to look at the past. And if you go further back, uh, just from last term, it was way over fifty percent that we were taking from utilities, but. To get from a state where you were taking that amount from utilities to not taking anything for operating, I mean, yes, your expenses are going to go up. Now it's just hopefully, you know, getting the, the revenue to catch up with it, but we are balancing the budget every year without taking utility profits that are needed for all of the upgrades. And any edit that we do at this point for the budget depending on if we're adding money or, or you know or not is go we're going to have to get it somewhere else and and that would rely on probably or you utility cut, or profits or you can cut expenses you don't have to get it from somewhere else you just cut personnel or purchases well i mean that's that's what you have to look at that we're, we're putting these things in based on investing in the city to do better when when you put in a 2.65 million dollar purchase of parkland after a budget's been presented with no communication with me or, or anybody in the city, that, that, that requires a lot more work on our part. <coughs> and we don't have enough money in the, re in the reserves. Borrowing money from the rainy day fund, I don't think is prudent because it's there for an emergency. Reserves right now, we still have, and that's what I wanted to, to get on the schedule, um, we still have left gas to to discuss and then just all of the capital Matt, improvements I don't, I don't want to cut you off we're, we're one minute till six okay. let's adjourn we'll, we'll continue this discussion